with us. We're honored that you're, you're here today. Let me say a word of response on behalf of our church um, to the Mboya family. Moses and Tenosi and Abby, thank you for your words this morning. And please know that you mean immeasurably more to us. We are more grateful for you than we could ever possibly express. So thank you for serving as leaders in our service again today. And let me say also a word of welcome, uh, or a, a word of welcome home to my friend Eddie. Uh, Eddie Bowden gave me my big break. My first opportunity to be an RA leader uh, was when Eddie uh, let me do that at my home church uh, as a college student. And we had a, a great, I think, three years together serving as, as RA leaders. And uh, recently, the carpet was replaced at my home church in the area where we did RAs. And I'm pretty sure the majority of the stains in that carpet that had to be taken up and completely replaced were from my run as an RA leader. So, but they didn't bill us, did they, Eddie? So it's, it's all right. Eddie, it's good to have you back with us this morning. Well, we continue this morning a sermon series from the Gospel of John. Uh, we're now three weeks into our journey to the cross and to the empty tomb. That is to say, this sermon series will carry us all the way up to and through uh, the celebration of Resurrection Sunday. Easter Sunday will be uh, sort of the culmination of this sermon series. And as we are walking to the cross through the fourth gospel, there are a couple of topics that we're focusing in on in John's gospel. The first one has to do with this question of time. Uh, every uh, scripture that we study on these Sundays getting ready for Easter will be a passage where either Jesus or the storyteller in John's gospel make a comment about the timing of Jesus' ministry. For example, a couple of weeks ago when we read that famous story from John chapter 2 about Jesus at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, he hesitates to render assistance when people approach him because it's not yet his time. Uh, the storyteller also notes uh, that are a number of times where it's, it either is not yet his time or signals that the time has come for certain things to happen in Jesus' ministry. And next Sunday, we will look a little bit more deeply at what those passages mean and how they sort of work together within the broader story of John's gospel. But the second topic that we're focusing in on each week is the question of how Jesus saves. Many of us have driven by billboards or we've uh, been wandering through some, some downtown of some city someplace and have seen a blinking sign on the side of a, of a rescue mission. Some of us even use that language in our own lives it, and it rolls off the tongue with great meaning to us. Jesus saves. But have we stopped to think about how that happens? Have we stopped to give attention to the variety of ways that Jesus brings salvation into our lives? And what we've seen already in this series is that in every aspect of our lives, in every aspect of our being, it's a place where Jesus saves. Jesus saves us in every expression of who we are. And so a couple of weeks ago, starting out in this series, we talked about how Jesus saves us as a sacrifice, that most ancient and most widespread practice of religious expression seeking forgiveness, Jesus saves us in that most familiar religious act of, of, of sacrifice. Last week we talked about how Jesus saves us in the political realm of our lives. That in the, in the great tug of war between forces of good and, and evil, that God has a greater claim of citizenship on our lives as citizens within the kingdom of God than any force of evil could possibly claim simply because of the mess that I've made of my life. God's claims are greater and higher. Today our passage comes from John chapter 8. In a moment, I'll start reading at verse 12, and I would love for you to look there and follow along with me as I read just a quick word about context. At the outset of John chapter 8, 
is that rich and familiar passage, Jesus teaching in the temple when a woman is brought out of the crowd and, and sort of shoved into the inner circle of these people and is accused of adultery, accused of being caught in the very act of adultery. And the men around her leering and glaring and snarling at her bring up this charge that she should be put to death. Now, if you've done your research, you know that the law says that uh, there are two involved in this act and both are to be put to death and he or she stands alone. It's at the end of that story at verse 12 that our passage begins today. Jesus still in Jerusalem. Remember last week we talked about how John's gospel is the one that sort of fills in some of the gaps that Matthew and Mark and Luke uh, don't emphasize in their wonderful tellings of the story. For whatever reason, they simply don't emphasize that Jesus was in the habit of going to Jerusalem on a regular basis. John is the one gospel that lets us know Jesus made one after another after another trip to Jerusalem for worship. He, he participated in those religious pilgrimages of his day. And so here he is in Jerusalem on one of those pilgrimages, and here is his experience, starting at John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I've come from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is valid. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus begins this teaching with one of the most powerful images in all of Scripture. I am the light of the world. And anyone here who has experienced that light starting to shine into your own experience can testify to what it is like to see the light coming on in you and changing how you view everything in your world. But unfortunately in our story today, before this image can start to sink into the souls of the listeners who witness it firsthand, some of the opposition of Jesus begins to change the setting with what they have to say. Jesus makes this rich claim, I am the light of the world, and he does so in a very specific setting. He's in Jerusalem on religious pilgrimage because it is the festival of booths. Now the festival of booths is something that's time set aside to commemorate God's faithfulness in bringing God's people, the Hebrews, out of Egypt where they had been slaves under Pharaoh's thumb and bringing them through their wilderness wanderings until they were able to enter the promised land. If you want the rest of that story, come to my Sunday school class today. Joshua's finally, how, how many weeks are we into this study? And we're finally crossing the river now and going into the promised land. But the Festival of Booths commemorates this. And part of the Festival of Booths is, is the lighting of these massive lamps in some of the inner areas of the temple. In other words, some areas of the temple that often remain shrouded in shadow have light upon them now. 
There are people who go all year. There are others who can't get there on a regular basis who go decades, some perhaps even all their lives, and this is the only time that those parts of the temple are illumined to them. It's the perfect context for Jesus to say, I am the light of the world. And yet before those words can sink in, suddenly his opponents begin to reframe the setting. They want to make this a court of law. And they use language of the legal system in accusing Jesus. They say to him, essentially, you bear false witness. Or at least you bear invalid and incomplete witness. Because our, our law, presumably, they're, they're referring to a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 19 that talks about how we are to... Uh, how we are to confirm people's claims. They say, you only have one witness, and by the way, your witness doesn't count because you can't give witness to yourselves. So Jesus responds to their objection with two points. First of all, he says in verse 14, since, he, he, it, and I can just imagine him doing, can't you just see Jesus looking around the room? Well, it looks to me like I'm the only one here from heaven. So... I guess I'm the only one that can really testify to my true identity. There's, there's something of that in what Jesus says in verse 14. Then he says in verse 18, we want to talk about the Father. He says, the Father also gives witness to my true identity, and he will be my second witness to satisfy your claims, your objections. Now, presumably... Jesus is referring to the Father's witness. Uh, presumably he's talking about uh, his, his signs, his wonders, his miracles that he's been performing in John's gospel. Remember we talked about how John, more than any other gospel, emphasizes that Jesus has a special purpose for his miracles. In other words, when Jesus heals someone in John's gospel, it's not solely for the healing. When Jesus brings powers of darkness out of someone's life, it's not only for that purpose. It's not just to give people what they want. It is so that people will believe. And oh, by the way, so that in their belief, they will bear witness to what they've seen so that other people can learn and believe as well. That's very different from some of the other gospels, especially uh, Mark's gospel, where Jesus is always saying, now don't tell anyone what I've just done for you. The response from religious opposition, who had already decided several chapters earlier that they wanted to be rid of Jesus, and have now gone three chapters in John's gospel, having decided that they want to see Jesus killed, they come to the place where they are ready to do it themselves. In fact, we need to understand sort of the framing device of this chapter, the way that it's preserved, because at the start of the chapter, this poor woman is thrust into the center of this, this crowd of people, and these horrible accusations are made of her, and there are people who want to stone her. They want to they want to take her life from her violently at their own hands, but by the end of the chapter, at verse 59, some of these same people are ready to do this same act toward Jesus. And he, right in the middle, makes this claim that he is the light of the world, though he is surrounded by people living in shadow. Their response that Jesus points about his testimony about the Father is so disappointing. And it just illumines for us how wicked, how cruel sometimes persons of faith can be in their unchecked self-righteousness. Verse 19, they say to Jesus, Where's your Father? Where's your father? How cruel. We've seen Jesus' family already in, in the fourth gospel. We've seen Jesus' mother. We've seen uh, 
uh, others of his same generation approaching him, asking him to come to Jerusalem with them for an earlier festival. We talked about that last week, that initially he says, no, I don't think I'm going to come this time. And then they get on their way and he says, yes, I will come. And he arrives at the city after them. Wherever Joseph has been, he is most likely deceased at this point. How heartless to say to someone, where is your father? And how vulgar as well. Everything that the Gospels have to say about Jesus' father, his earthly father, Joseph, is shrouded in controversy. Uh, Luke and Matthew in their Gospels go into great detail to describe uh, the, the, the relationship between Joseph and Mary and to remind us of the fact that, that they were not yet married when she uh, shared the news that she was expecting a little one. How heartless, how vulgar, to speak this way to someone about his father. We would hope this would be the low point, but it isn't. Things continue downhill until that moment I mentioned a, mo a moment ago in verse 59 where they are ready to stone him. But remember verse 12, this claim from Jesus' lips, I am the light of the world, continues to hover and the light from those flames alit for the festival of booze seem, continue to flicker in the air. What a reminder. The brighter Jesus shines, the more the darkness is exposed. And the more those living in darkness desire to come to the light. Jesus has already said elsewhere, I came as the physician to those who are sick. But the more darkness is exposed, the darker it becomes. Like an animal that is wounded or is caged, in its desperation, in its woundedness, it is its most dangerous. So it is with darkness. And those who cause darkness are more likely to lash out when the light shines upon them. We have seen Jesus in this temple transformed by accusation into a makeshift courtroom. It is a reminder that in some sense our lives play out in a heavenly courtroom as well. For those of us who are wondering how does Jesus save, one answer is that Jesus saves us legally. Jesus saves us in the legal aspect of our being. Jesus saves us in the heavenly courtroom of our lives. The question might be phrased this way. Does our inability to live exactly as God designed mean we may not live in God's kingdom any longer? A simpler way to ask that question. Is our sin stronger than God's love? A more practical way still to ask that question. In this divine handshake between creator and created, who has the tighter grip? God or me? We find a secondary answer to these questions in our closest human relationships. Particularly those of us who are Christians. Uh, there's someone in our lives in our homes, in our Sunday school classes, somewhere in our lives who loves us and tries to love in the way that God loved. And so even in our most meaningful human relationships, we know sometimes we let each other down. Now please no testimonies about the argument you had this morning over your cup of coffee or anything along those lines. And, and, and of course, please hear me say, I'm not talking about those extreme acts that we know have happened for some individuals. We're not talking about abuse or unfaithfulness or these sorts of horrible things. We're talking about the nature of sharing life together. 
even between people who love one another dearly, that sometimes we get crossways with one another, sometimes uh, we, we get sideways with one another, sometimes there are difficulties even with the people we love most. And of course, we are not the kind of people who treat this as a math problem. We don't go through our lives with a little tally sheet that says, well, six times this week you offended me and only five times did you make me feel really happy, so that's it. That's not how we live our lives. We live our lives that in most cases, the sense of wrong is not the definition of the relationship. It is not the end of things. How is that possible? It's because we who are in Christ have the capacity to keep loving one another despite our flaws. Back to the heavenly courtroom. Those questions again, does our inability to live exactly as God designed mean we are no longer welcome to live in God's kingdom? A simpler way to ask it, is our sin stronger than God's love? Or who has the tighter grip, God or me? The answer some way, somehow, mysteriously and wondrously is there in verse 12, at least in part. As Jesus casts this lovely image over the people, even those who want to transform this place of worship into a place of legal judgment. Jesus, as light of the world, shines such a bright and warm light upon our reality that it shows a new way forward. It shows a new sense of things, a new pathway perhaps we had never seen, certainly we had never appreciated. And one way that that light shines is in the roles God is willing to play. Look with me at verses 15 and 16, at the way Jesus talks about his relationship with the Father. He says to him, recognizing, y'all want to make this place of worship a place of judgment? You're not the judge. My Father is the judge. God, the creator and sustainer of life, is the judge. And in that heavenly courtroom, where the question of whether unrighteousness trumps love plays out. Not only has God written the law, not only has God handed the law for God's creation to experience and abide by or choose not to, God also interprets the law. God renders judgment on the law. And so when I look in the mirror, and I see someone who is habitually, chronically committed to doing the very best I can muster to ruin myself and everyone else around me, God looks at that same person and says, well, to declare this individual innocent would be untrue. Jesus, Jesus who saves us, Jesus walks across that heavenly courtroom over to the bench of the accused and sits down in my seat. Jesus, though innocent, though blameless, though perfection, Though God made flesh, Jesus takes on the role of the guilty, even though he is not guilty. And God the judge says, forgive him. The one who wrote the law, the one who gives the law, is also the one who interprets the law forgiven. So the question for you and I is then, forgiven to what? Forgiven for what? 
The Apostle Paul asked this question in Romans chapter 6, so that sin may abound all the more? No. Forgiven to walk in the way of the light of the world. Forgiven to walk as a reflection of that light. To walk as a beacon of that light. To one who walks shining and sharing and illumining that light wherever and whenever we go. This morning, friends, that is our invitation. That we who say we are in Christ would live lives of light. To live lives of hope, mercy, righteousness, goodness. That we would shine the light in places of persistent shadow. Never forgetting that there was one who sat in our seat. There was one who took our place. And a righteous God said, forgive him. But others who have never begun that journey, you may be realizing today, you may be making this connection today for the very first time, and, and in response you may be saying, I, I've got to do something, what do I do? Take that first step of saying yes, of receiving. If, if this played out in an earthly courtroom, you would not simply sit at that table indefinitely. You would stand up and walk out as a free person. Though it was undeserved, though you may, you may question the judgment of it, you would walk out a freed person and go about your life. Let it be so. If today you are ready to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, if you're ready to receive the gift of what has been done to you, though you, you would resist it, though you would, would, would deny it, today you will accept the fact that you are forgiven and have been given a new direction to walk in the way of light. If that's your decision today, then this next part of the service is for you. To come and share what it is that's on your heart today. Our musicians are going to lead us. I'll be standing down front. We'd love to hear what is on your heart today, how it is that you're responding to the work of the Holy One in your life. First step, next step. Forgiven, forgiving. Recipient of the light, one who is shining the light. Stand now and give praise. And if there's a decision on your heart today, won't you share it with us this morning?